So, first of all, thank you for choosing this panel uh, for this session. My name is Bertrand La Chapelle. I'm the uh, director of the this Internet and Transition Project. Paul Fellinger, who is here, is working with me as the manager of the project. We have intended this uh, session to be an opportunity to basically present the type of problem that we're trying to address, in fact, the dialogue that we're facilitating, um, to highlight how this dialogue is working and how it achieves the objective, uh, what the objectives are, and also to connect and invite a certain number of actors who have been or who are closely associated and participating in the project or are following it uh, in different respects to highlight why it connects with what they are doing in either their own region or the different um, issues that they are addressing on their own. So, I will maybe start by asking each of them to introduce themselves and as I told them, to say in one sentence or two why they think the topic that we are addressing today is important from their perspective, from their viewpoint. Carlos. So hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Carlos Afonso, I'm a professor at the Rio de Janeiro State University back in Brazil and director of the ITS, the Institute for Technology and Society based in Rio. So uh, I would say my background that and that like bringing me to the to the project uh, is that we were uh, the ones behind the whole idea of uh, the Marco Civil, the Internet Bill of Rights in Brazil, like uh, almost six years ago. Uh, and the Marco Civil grown to be a collaborative and a, a general uh, purpose uh, project, an initiative that is now being discussed in the Congress uh, and probably being voted on. So my perspective to this, uh, to this project is the idea that we have been for a while discussing principles of the usage and the governance of the internet. And we have this uh, truly constellation of uh, charters and principles and very bright initiatives around. And the Internet and Jurisdiction Project offers a second layer to this uh, discussion, which is to deal with the implementation of the principles through procedures. So, to get a clear view on how uh, very practical procedures could implement the principles that we are discussing in a number of events, and most, uh, I would say, close, closer to the event that we're having today, we have the National GIAO meeting in Sao Paulo the, later this year. So, it's going to be a good opportunity to discuss principles and to advance uh, the debate <laughs> on, on procedures. Romantic. Okay. <laughs> What's a very romantic hat? It's getting better and better. better. <laughs> no, 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 you're talking about Brazil at the end of the day. I was worried it was going to be dark by the time I got my turn. My name is Kate Westmoreland. Um, I'm an international lawyer. Um, I've worked a lot um, with the government on international crime cooperation um, issues in Australia and since being um, in the Bay Area for the past couple of years have been researching um, the MLAT system, the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty System, um, and ways in which to better um, apply it to the online context. Um, and I'm working with Access at the moment on um, trying to bring, um, uh, bring a civil society perspective and help drive some initiatives to improve the MLAT system. Um, so I think there's lots of overlaps between the work that we're doing on the MLAT system and um, the Internet and Jurisdiction project. There's, um, in some respects, we're sort of a subset of the issues that um, Internet and Jurisdiction is working on. Um, the MLAT system is um, solely for criminal aspects, dealing with the questions of um, how do you... Um, how do you, in many cases, compel access to user data from one jurisdiction um, for use in another jurisdiction for criminal investigations and prosecutions, and very much at that issue where there may be no physical connection um, whatsoever between the company that holds the data and where the crime um, is alleged to have occurred or where the suspect is. So I think um, we, um, in one sense, it's also bound by a very old treaty system, so 
Um, that gives some structure, some history to having dealt with this problem, but it also provides limitations on the difficulties with changing that. So I think it's interesting, I'm interested to watch and participate in the ideas outside of that MLAT system and see how that can apply or not apply um, in the criminal context. Good morning. Uh, my name is Pranish Prakash. Uh, I'm a policy director with the Centre for Internet and Society in Bangalore, and I'm currently also an Access to Knowledge Fellow at the Information Society Project of the Yale Law School. Um, I'll give a non-work related reason for why I'm, I'm interested <laughs> in this. Um, when I first got onto the internet, uh, within a few years, one of the first things that, that really caught my fancy uh, was this idea of, of jurisdiction. Uh, these were the heydays where there was the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace and, and other such romantic ideas going around. Uh, and uh, there's this also the time when courts are first grappling with these issues, uh, first in, 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 in the US, uh, in Europe, in India slowly uh, thereafter. Uh, there are, it, it's a time when the rules are getting set down and, and I'm immediately drawn into this. Eventually I go on to, to study law and, and while doing so uh, end up with a focus on, on, on technology copyright, etc., which led me to, to my job. And, and despite the, the enormous amount of academic writing since uh, actually the early to mid-90s onwards uh, around these issues, uh, we still haven't really gotten to, to solutions. And uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, I'm, I'm uh, really enthused by what's going on with the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, as well as uh, the work that's happening around MLATs, etc., uh, and the, the shifts going on in the Internet governance uh, field, uh, uh, because we actually might be slowly moving towards putting in places, uh, places <coughs> sorry, uh, which might uh, help uh, prove to be solutions that last longer. Good morning. Hello, my name is Simona Hanning. I work for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm responsible for internet freedom at the Human Rights Department. And before I worked for the Freedom and Dutch Digital and Digital Digital Rights NGO. Some of you know that you know it before that I was actually a lawyer, so I have a legal background. Um, the reason I'm here today is that um, I'm actually intrigued, or maybe also a little bit apprehensive about the, 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 the debate on internet governance now in a broad sense, in the sense that lots of issues are, are conflated, so um, I agree with Finesh that we would like to have a very concrete, <coughs> maybe you would like to sort of move to concrete solutions, but I also see that more and more sort of actors are joining the discussion uh, and more and more issues are thrown on a, on a, on a um, big mountain of sort of internet governance issues, and so it becomes more and more difficult. So I think having a meaningful discussion about very specific issues and how to go about that is very important. Uh, and most importantly, I think it's very important that the human rights perspective is, um, is, is, taken, um, is taken as a starting point in those discussions. Hi everybody, so thank you for joining us here now. My name is Carolina Rossini, I'm originally from Brazil. I live now in Washington, D.C. And I worked on these issues for the past 13 years, and you can say that I've been I pass through all the stakeholders in this dialogue, <laughs> from Telefonica, where I was a lawyer for seven years, to uh, now uh, where I'm joining public knowledge directly in international work. I'm also a FF, alumni, and I'm working as I think that's it. So I think one of the things that most surprised uh, makes me curious and, and what we, that makes me want to engage on this discussion is uh, something that the jurisdiction project is all about, which they want to try to set a due process framework to handle cross-border requests for domain seizures, content takedown, and access to user data. So if you look down to these three elements I just said, so repeating, domain seizures, content takedowns, and access to user data, we are dealing with so many issues on what we call the content layer, the social layer, from privacy to freedom of expression to human rights, to even surveillance nowadays, 
uh, and, and these issues, they do have different impacts in different stakeholders. So understanding uh, what these issues are about and where we can talk to each other and where we can cooperate, it, I, I do hope that that's the way to move forward in terms of building good national law and, and policy. Right, so from, for example, from a national standpoint, one of the things we're going to talk later here and understand is the meeting in Brazil, right, and, and, and surveillance issues. So if we think about how we can understand how these requests are doing and how the companies are being well enough uh, regarding their transparency reports, and if we should be pushing governments who have signed, for example, the Open Government Partnership to also be more transparent about that, we probably will generate much more legal security for all the stakeholders involved in this process. So I think that's uh, one of my main interests in this thing. Thank you. Uh, is this one working? Or not yet? No, not yet? Okay. So, following these brief inter introductions of, of, about the project, I'd like to very quickly go through what it addresses and how it addresses it. Address it. I'll try to be very quick. You have on your seat a uh, brochure that explains in more detail what I'm going to try to say in, in short. Fundamentally, the starting point, the starting challenge that brought us to launch this initiative is the recognition that we are in an environment where there's a tension between the cross-border nature of the internet, which is the main quality of the internet that needs to be preserved, and a traditional system that is based on the separation of sovereignties and national jurisdictions that are geographically bounded. That's the level one of the problem. The challenge is that when you get to uh, how it works, this tension illustrates itself by multiplication of national laws that sometimes overlap, that sometimes are applied extraterritorially, and at the same time, a set of uh, rules that apply to users of internet uh, services that are defined by the terms of service that have a transborder nature. And in many cases, there is a lot of tensions when the law in one country is not compatible with the law in another country because more and more the interaction between people is a cross border. What used to be uh, the exception, like transborder interaction between people, is not becoming the majority, but it's becoming much more than an exception. And any transborder service provider is actually dealing with the interactions of sometimes hundreds of millions of people who are completely distributed around the world. And so, if I think about some of the elements that have been mentioned to illustrate what we're doing, there was a time where the question was, there's one type of space, and it is completely detached from uh, the, the physical world and the laws that apply in the physical world. This hasn't lasted long, because obviously laws apply. And the problem today is, in a nutshell, that there's no one-on-one -on -one mapping between the physical space and cyberspaces. You cannot do it like uh, basically the uh, air space or um, maritime borders. It's, it's not mapping in a geographic way. Worse or better, it is all about shared spaces and how sovereignty and laws apply in shared spaces. And so, the key challenge is this situation is a situation that is not satisfactory for any category of actor. Without getting into details, it's not satisfactory for governments because there is a difficulty in applying national laws. It is not satisfactory for uh, platforms or operators because they are confronted with a patchwork of national norms and have no tools necessarily to solve them. And it is not satisfactory for civil society groups or human rights groups because in many cases, the situation of the absence of transborder rules is basically putting the burden of making the decision on the private actors when there is a transborder request for domain series, for time takedown, or access to user data. And so when we identified this problem in 2012, we organized meetings 
where the different actors said, there is a problem here, it is not going to be solved by treaty negotiations, it cannot be solved just by business guidelines, um, it is not only about advocacy, it's about finding, and I pick one of the words that have been used, concrete operational procedural interfaces to handle those transborder requests, in particular to introduce a due process framework that protects and operationalizes human rights. Fundamentally, the procedure is we're facilitating a multi-stakeholder dialogue process. We organize that has actually involved more than 60 entities, different governments, different large companies, and, and civil society group and international organizations. And last year, we organized four meetings, one in Brazil, and Carlos was instrumental in helping us uh, doing that in Brazil. We organized one in uh, France, where we are. Um, CIS, to which uh, Pranesh belongs, was participating and helping us also in the organization of one in Delhi, in, in India, and one in Washington, um, in which actually Carlos and I participated. And the outcome of this process last year was the identification of six components that you will find in the, in the brochure for what a framework for handling those transborder requests could be. In that regard, you will be able to look more in detail and we're open for questions. I don't want to take too much time. Fundamentally, this is about bringing every actor around the table, the relevant stakeholders, so that they collectively and together define the framework that will organize their relationship and the handling of the normative tensions that exist. I'd like to, to actually um, pick on what Carlos was saying regarding our principles and there is the concrete layer of how things actually work. Um, in that regard, without getting into the details of the, um, of the different uh, building blocks, how do you see that uh, illustrated or taking part in the larger discussion internationally of how to develop such frameworks? How is the methodology potentially illustrating how multi-stakeholder discussions work? So let me try to, to bring a Brazilian example that could be interesting for us to, to understand how this, this conversation is important for us to come up with uh, a more broader vision on procedures and how that could be helpful for domestic uh, jurisdictions. So in Brazil, we have uh, a situation in which right now there is uh, being set a vote in the Congress, this, uh, there is something that we could call civil rights framework or Internet Bill of Rights for the Brazilian Internet, so whatever you want to call it. And uh, it's there to a vote. It's going to be the, uh, the 12th time that people will end up trying to get a vote on, on this bill in the Congress. And it's quite interesting because it's a very, uh, it's a bill that I would say in its core is about principles. So we talk about net neutrality, about privacy, about freedom of expression, and about how those principles are going to be uh, enforced and set into law in Brazil in what concerns internet. But at the same time, there is a second level and the very same view of law that is going to deal with more practical issues such as content removal, the operation of net neutrality, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't deal with domain seizures, uh, even though like the CGIPR in, in Brazil, the internet steering committee uh, has been very reluctant in involving domain seizures, such as the cases that we have seen recently uh, abroad. But the reason I'm telling you this is that you could have in the very set, in the very same set of, uh, of, of a law, the principles and issues about implementation. So when it comes to content removal, we are. It looks like it's going to get approved a provision <coughs> in our bill of law that says that. Um, Providers will not be uh, intermediaries, will not be liable uh, until they do not comply with a judicial order. So, if they are notified, uh, if they receive a cease and desist letter of some sort, and they have aware the awareness that some illicit content is posted in there, like a social network or a platform, they are not obliged to remove that content. 
that they only could do that, or that only will be responsible if they do not remove that, if they fail to comply with judicial order. It's a pretty high standard for safeguard for providers. But at the same time, we have an exclusion of copyright content from this uh, provision. And at the same time, another provision in the Marcos Review, we have the issue of forced localization, which means that Brazil is pushing forward with the idea of having some uh, companies that deal with private data of Brazilians to store those data and all those data in, in Brazil, which is something that we have been discussing uh, around in this in this conference. Yesterday we had a panel um, about it, and we could say definitely Carol could help me out here um, afterwards. Uh, it's controversial if this provision is going to be approved or not. But the reason I'm telling you guys this is that Brazil is pretty much well known to put up a multi-folder approach to the internet. We have the CGIBR and have a bunch of experiences that are just now begin to be researched and explained on. But at the same time, you could have in a single country a multi-stakeholder experience that is quite well known, a view of law that is going to be set to a vote in the Congress that deals with a lot of, a lot of principles, but when it comes to procedures, you have a lot of controversies that need to be addressed. And that's where uh, I think uh, a project like Internet Jurisdiction step in, providing a good framework and providing a good vision for us to discuss international practices and what's going to be the impact if this or that country uses that or, or the other solution. Yeah, actually, uh, two, two things from what you just said. One is the fact that Putting people around the table to develop something works also at the national level in different ways. But the key challenge is that even if you use that at the national level, it applies to the operators that, or the actors who are on the territory, and it only applies to actors who are outside of the territory if you begin to extend the applicability of your national law to another territory or country. The problem is that if you multiply this, you end up creating a patchwork of things that are not necessarily compatible. So in that regard, the procedures that allow the interaction across border between actors, uh, public actors, and foreign platforms is something that is traditionally not handled just by the national law. It's handled by cooperation treaty, and then I, I, I turn to, uh, to Kate, because she mentioned the word MLAT. Uh, who's familiar with the expression mutual legal assistance treaty? Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> it, it helps, it saves time. <laughs> so in a nutshell, mutual legal assistance treaty, as the name implies, is treaties between governments that deal with how they cooperate mostly on um, cooperation among law enforcement for, in particular, getting access to user data in criminal investigations. The challenge is this system, and uh, Kate will, will detail a little bit, has limitations in terms of how well it functions and limitations in scope. And one of the key elements that uh, we're trying to develop when we, when we talk together is where the procedures basically match and whether, for instance, a discussion on the format of requests can make the whole system move forward. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing on the uh, MLAB reform and how it fits with uh, what we're doing in that? Sure. Um, I think there's a couple of interesting ways that it, it overlaps and that question of procedure comes up. So um, on the MLAT specific front, we're looking at ways in which it's, I mean, it's a 20th century system, um, which it actually applies to a whole, a whole range of things. Online records is one aspect and um, a growing aspect, but it's by no means um, the only aspect. Um, it can be used for financial records, for um, any kinds of search warrants or statements from witnesses, etc. Um, but I think that the online context is where it's very obvious the, the way in which it struggles to adapt to the speed and the, cross, um, the complexities of cross-jurisdictional um, issues. Um, so I think that um, 
it's a bit of a two-pronged approach, at least, that needs to happen on that front. We're looking at ways in which to improve the MLAT system, um, to make it faster, to make it easier to understand, um, in an effort to um, for people where it is appropriate to be using that system as, as well as they can. But I think we also need to acknowledge that um, it's not actually the vehicle that will be able to solve all requests um, for user data for criminal um, matters. Um, it's just not um, the way it involves so many levels of bureaucracy and safeguards and procedures, formal treaty procedures, which is excellent in many um, circumstances, but it, it can't apply to everything. And I think that um, when people look at the MLAT system, they think everything, there's, you, you hear the call that it needs to be fixed and everything should go through the MLAT system. And I understand some of the sentiment because it ex it's been existing for a long time. It seems, it feels kind of safe um, that it's at that international treaty level. But um, in practice, there's a lot of uncertainties and interpretations that happen. And it also, um, it's a specific beast. I don't think that it is appropriate for necessarily all information about um, IP addresses or subscriber um, information, etc. Um, so you need to look at what the safeguards are that we like about the MLAT system, when it's appropriate, and how to make it work as well as possible. But also when things are happening outside of the MLAT system, to make sure that procedures and processes are in place um, that mean that there is due process. Um, I don't think that we would want, um, you wouldn't advocate that the only way to achieve due process in every single circumstance for criminal matters is through the MLAT system. But I think that um, some of the lessons learnt um, in the MLAT system apply to the um, informal or police to police um, cooperation and that we need to think closely about what's good about each system and how to um, A, work with the structure that we have now and B, um, in the longer term, where, how would we like to see that work? I don't know that, um, I mean, maybe a new treaty system would be an excellent solution, but having done enough bilateral um, MLAT negotiations, they take years, and that's just two countries, so I don't think we can hold our breath on that, and we need to be thinking more about other procedural safeguards and ways in which to approach it. Thank you. I think you, 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 you frame it, as you can imagine, in the course of one hour and 15 minutes, we are not going to cover everything. What we're trying to do is do a certain number of snapshots that we can dig deeper afterwards in the questions. But what is important, what Kate was saying, is that, and this is a question that we often uh, get, is, is this thing supposed to replace the, um, is the, the process supposed to replace the MLAT system? Is the MLAT system supposed to make this kind of process irrelevant? The answer is no in both cases. The MLATs exist, and there is a very interesting work that is being done to make them more efficient in the field where they are useful and the scope that they have. And at the same time, there is a lot of other issues that are growing, particularly on content-related issues, particularly on issues that are not related to criminal uh, investigation, which is usually the scope of MLATs, and that need to be addressed. It may take a while, but it is a complementary um, uh, element. I'd like to move to, 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 to Pranesh in a, in a subsequent um, uh, question. As I was saying earlier, we are in a situation where we have today the existence of terms of service for corporations that basically apply to users that are across borders and sometimes to a pretty large number of users when you have a platform that has hundreds of millions if not billion or one of them at least <laughs> uh, users and of course as a company the desire to have as uniform terms of service as possible is an actual uh, trend because there's a desire to make things as easy to possi as possible to manage the fact is that those terms of service determine the rules for the sort of digital space or the digital territory that those platforms represent. And in many cases, there is a tension because the terms of service are often attached or connected or established jurisdiction with the country of incorporation of the company, whereas the users are in another jurisdiction where some of the things that are posted may be illegal or not acceptable. So, we're in a situation today where to handle those tensions, as I said earlier, there is the um, 
treaty approach that would be a traditional intergovernmental discussion, which is not only unlikely, but probably not the right type of instrument. You have the national laws that produce a potential patchwork of things. And at the same time, you have the terms of service that are developed, but that are developed by purely private entities. So Pranesh, what we're trying to do in the, in the project is to bring the actors together to get out of this conundrum of having to choose something that is only by one category of actors. How can we leverage the concept of due process and, and procedural protections so that they basically migrate and are endorsed by the different actors rather than coming from one group only? Uh, there's the simple straight answer to that, uh, which is uh, ensure that companies implement those kinds of, uh, you know, principles of natural justice and due process within their terms of service. Uh, but the more complicated <coughs> answer to that would, would involve us looking at how uh, there is, to an extent, uh, I'd like to recognize that right now there's a, there's a session going on about policy laundering in, in, the, in, in the space of of uh, intellectual property rights and copyright uh, laws. Uh, there is an enormous amount of terms of service laundering that happens uh, as well. Uh, governments uh, freely take from terms of service of, of corporations like, uh, like Yahoo. Uh, if I recall right, the government of Minnesota, for instance, I, I was going through one of its, uh, one of its websites, terms of service where, where virtually identical. Uh, the Indian government in, in, uh, in the recent past uh, put out something called uh, the rule, intermediary guidelines rules under the Information Technology Act. And what do they do? How do they come upon these rules? They basically copy pasted from <laughs> the terms of service of Yahoo, World of Warcraft, and a bunch of other places, <laughs> and stuck it all together. And, 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 I wish I were kidding, <laughs> but and and they slapped it all together, and now that is law. And they are saying the Indian government has tried to put a spin on it. They tried to say that it's actually self-regulation uh, that they're promoting uh, by putting in place terms of service of different actors uh, into law and making that applicable to those actors. Their their question is if. If these are fine for Yahoo and for Google and for other corporations to have, what is wrong with having these same things in law? And obviously there's the, the, the answer, there's the easy legal answer that, well, they're not bound by the Constitution of India, whereas you are. Uh, but that actually isn't an easy enough answer if you think a little bit deeply about it. Because that makes you realize that these things that we take for granted, uh, free speech, constitutionalism, etc., when it comes to states, we can't actually take for granted when it comes to corporations. Uh, that, that the rise of corporations, uh, and on the internet, everything is either private property or, or, or uh, you know, regulated by either property laws or through contractual laws, right? And there is no public space, there is no uh, public square, as Frank LaRue, uh, who's a special rapporteur on freedom of speech, likes to put it, he, he thinks of uh, the internet as uh, the plaza publica, the public square. But actually, no, it's, it's more like a shopping mall. It's all private property. You can enter, you can go through things, sure, but, but you don't have the same rights. And uh, so that's the. If I, if I may, sorry to interrupt you, but just to pick on that one. Isn't it a little bit of simplification to say it's only one thing? Isn't this that the cyberspace are a collection of cyberspaces, some of which are public, some of which are semi-private, and some of it are, are private, and maybe there are an emerging set of different rules that will evolve? Sure, that's one possible way of looking at it, but uh, if, you, if you go down to the brass tacks of, of, of law, then you'd realize that whether, even if you run your own server, even if you run your own ISP, in order to reach out to, in order to be connected to the internet, you have to go through private property belonging to other people. You have to go through level three, you have to go through 
uh, different kinds of ISPs, different people, servers, and that's how the internet's architecture works. So one way or the other, you are moving out of the realm of constitutionalism, uh, and, and especially the constitution of your own country. Especially this is cross borders. Exactly. And, and uh, so that's one, one very important reason to look not only at your own laws or laws of other countries, but how those laws, etc., are reflected in different, uh, different terms of service. And uh, I'd also like to make a, a quick point here about uh, how, while you're putting in place these terms of service, you also have to think about how uh, they're actually implemented. Uh, in, in the sense that uh, most terms of service have some kind of general clause about not violating any uh, applicable law. And what are applicable law is no anyone's guess, right? Uh, the jurisdiction they're talking about, no one really knows. But in India, for instance, we have a problem relating to sex selective, uh, sex -selective abortions. So uh, people find out uh, uh, the sex of their of their fetus and, and choose to have abortions if uh, that happens to be female. And uh, in India, we have a law prohibiting advertisement of uh, prenatal sex determination kits and, and uh, the non-regulated use of these kinds of kits uh, because it's a huge social problem in India, which has one of the first uh, gender ratios anywhere in the world. And whether or not Google uh, when it decides what ads to show, takes into consideration this kind of regulation, is to me a very, a very important question. Whether or not Google decides to follow what the election commission in, in Brazil says, uh, whether they find it reasonable or not, okay, for me is a very important question. And it's not the same thing as, as say, <laughs> political censorship in some evil dictatorship. Okay. And, and so, in democracies, how we deal with, with uh, these kinds of difficult issues, I, I think, uh, may, should make us think a lot about terms of service and how we deal with these issues. If I intended to have this panel explain to you how simple this problem is, I think we succeeded. <laughs> Thanks for the last, uh, the last point in particular, because it is a, a type of example that honestly I didn't have in mind and we had not even gone into. And it's a typical example of the tension between the responsibilities and the preoccupations on the three sides of the air in, in, in a certain way. If you put yourself in the shoes of a company, how are you going to honestly tweak all your algorithms and all your things to adapt to what is visible here, but not visible there, adapt to all the different laws that you may not even be aware of until there is a comment that says, well, there's a problem here. But if you're a government, and the example of uh, picking from the terms of service to draft the law is a very interesting feedback loop, uh, how do you make sure that when you impose legitimately your national regulation, you do not overextend. And basically, you only apply it to the zone where it is supposed to apply. So just for memory, because we don't have time to come back to all the issues, I want to highlight that after the, the, the previous things. What Pranesh has highlighted is three things that are worth exploring further. Is one, the diversity of national laws that have to be taken into account and that are, as he said, not only limited to uh, evil dictatorships and freedom of expression. It can be very legitimate national laws for very local reasons. Second thing is this whole discussion about public space, private space, and you can find online on our site, we had at the Internet Governance Forum in Baku, uh, not last year, but the year before, uh, a full session on a very interesting question, which is what is the geography of cyberspace? I.e., how do you structure the different spaces and the different rules that apply? And the third thing, without again belaboring, is the first element, which is what is the interplay, let's call it this way, 
between the private development of terms of service that now take de facto a stronger and stronger normative function and the traditional way of developing laws, what is the interplay, what is the relationship, and what the kind of process that we run to facilitate dialogue among those actors could potentially bring to make those things um, be conversion more more compatible. Let me let me turn to uh, to Simone because we've we've seen a certain number of perspectives. You are now with the um, um, Dutch government. Uh, you were in civil society groups uh, before. How do you see the challenge for governments, and particularly democratic governments, like we still believe in Europe, most of us are, <laughs> and I used to be a, an ambassador for France, so I still defend that we are a democracy. Uh, what is the challenge, how do you perceive the challenge of, on the one hand, defending a lot of freedom, you're going to participate and you're even involved in the organization, like uh, Martin here, of the Freedom Online Coalition meeting that will take place in Tallinn at the end of, uh, of April. How do you combine this desire to promote and maintain the freedom sustaining capacity of the internet with the natural desire to have the national law being respected when there's this tension of cross-border uh, platforms? How do, you, how do you see that? That's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's, it's very important to start a discussion every time with the fact that we don't have to come up with new principles. We have already universal human rights. It seems that in many of these discussions, that's actually sort of the starting point that's often forgotten. So it seems that many people think, well, we have the internet, we have fantastic opportunities. Let's see what we can do with it. Oh, hey, there are, there, there's also human rights. Yeah. Um, and so I think it should be the other way around. And, and, and you know, that we have... Um, uh, United Na Nations resolutions actually sort of emphasize that the same uh, rights that apply offline also apply online. Uh, I think the problem at this point is how, you know, like what exactly do we mean by that and how are we going to uh, effectively implement that on a national or an international level. Um, and so, at least from a government perspective, I think that is uh, what we need to focus on. I think that there's been great uh, developments on that point. You know, finally, we have privacy as an issue addressed in the UN, and so um, I was in an expert meeting last Monday, uh, the week before that, in Geneva on this issue, and it was incredible how many governments were there with interest for this issue, and so like, we're finally getting somewhere. Um, but it's, it's good that there's, there's resolutions with broad terms, but what we need is specific issues. Yeah. So, you know, like jurisdictional issues. Uh, are metadata covered by, you know, protection of privacy? Um, transparency, notification of users. Those are very specific issues that all lie within the ambit of the right of privacy, but need to be further discussed. Um, and so I applaud the fact that there's a development uh, on sort of the UN level, and there's expert meetings, Especially, I applaud the fact that there's so many experts there that have their own civic, uh, civic initiatives that sort of try to come up with solutions for that. Um, um, for example, uh, there's a necessary proportion principles. If you look at, for example, uh, the resolutions that are, the, the two resolutions that, that, that were the freedom of expression one and, and, and the privacy one, but also the, the report by Frank de la Rue, uh, la Rue from last year um, on freedom of expression. Um, and other documents on uh, in this field, you see that the, the necessary and proportionate principles are actually used an awful lot of time. They're actually like not awful, but like lots of times. That's very good, um, and they give a sort of they, they give content to the discussion. But the same goes for the fact that companies um, uh, produce transparency reports, and the fact that with every new transparency report that is published, like the the the, the information that is published is fine tuned with sort of the importance of what is published and how that contributes to the uh, sort of our expectation of privacy, or at least sort of understanding what happens uh, uh, increases. Another very important example is just national lawsuits. And so I think all these, um, uh, uh, all these actions sort of on a civic level feed into the discussion uh, on, on, for example, UN level, and sort of make it more meaningful. And I'd say I think the same goes for, for your project, and then it actually sort of, I think it sort of feeds it in the same way, but it's also more practical, because mm -hmm. I think the legal perspective is, also, is, is always very conceptual, and we also need to know how that works on a practical level, and I think that is often 
for governments a very important uh, issue in these discussions because like it's it's fantastic to know that there is a right to privacy and it should be <coughs> ensured and protected and it's very important but there needs to be it also needs to be it, the government also needs to be able to sort of know how to do it in, pra in practice mm -hmm. and so I think there there's sort of a more practical level that discussion is very welcome and um, so I think um, from the Dutch government perspective and also from the, from the Freedom Online Coalition perspective, I think the way that we try to contribute to this is, is with the Freedom Online Coalition. We've actually set up three working groups on specific issues, sort of delve into the specific, specifics of, of, for example, how can uh, human rights be um, uh, protected in the context of, of cybersecurity, same goes for the second working group, and that's transparency and privacy. And then there's also the whole issue of development. And so the idea is that within these multi-stakeholder um, uh, working groups, we're going to sort of um, flesh out specific issues and discuss them further. Um, another initiative that the Dutch government has taken um, is that we've asked, we have an advisory committee on, on international uh, issues that actually advises the government on uh, on human rights issues. So we actually asked them for an advice on how uh, human rights can be effectively implemented in national policy. And I think these kind of discussions are in the end very important and I, and I applaud everybody's uh, uh, contributions to that. Thank you. You highlighted it, it would open uh, an opportunity for a longer discussion on that specific point. Um, you highlight very uh, very nicely, as actually others have done, including Carlos, the fact that there are layers, basically. There are very general principles, there are uh, operational principles, and there are practical implementations. Uh, we have voluntarily focused the, uh, the initiative on this very transversal layer of procedures for those transborder requests in those three domains. And without getting into details, you will see in the in the document some of the words that you that you've used are actually among the building blocks of the regime that we're trying to help the participants build together this year. This includes how do you introduce in the management of the requests by design traceability so that transparency reporting can be produced almost automatically, or at least that there is data that is produced that can be uh, used. Uh, the term due process has been, has been used, and it is a core element, you see it on the, on the cover page of, of the brochure. Due process has many different dimensions, but that includes, for instance, uh, the right to be notified when there is a request, at least in certain cases, because of course there are cases where it shouldn't be notified. Um, but when there is notification, what is the contradictory procedures to, um, to allow defense, are there appeal mechanisms? Also, when a request is being made, how documented, and this goes back to the MLAT thing, how documented is the request in terms of the national level process that has been followed, and what are the guarantees that have been put in place at the national level? So these are among the building blocks, but exa exactly trying, as you said, to take as a starting point the general human rights framework uh, and try to help operationalize it through procedural safeguards and, and, and guarantees. And you're absolutely right, it goes also to the what we're going to discuss now. The, um, the, the desire to move beyond just the affirmation of principles to more operational uh, things. So, Carolina, may, may I make the connection to basically um, not only Net Mundial, but the whole international series of discussions and how they can be moving from just the production, which is not a bad thing, but just the production of multiple principles framework to the production of more operational principles for in general internet governance or specific topics and even concrete implementation. How do you see this fitting, including in the Net Mundial meeting? And maybe explain what Net Mundial is in your document. Uh, so, I actually, before arriving at Ninja, I want to make some of the links here because I do think we heard about how government, how this impacts government, how this impacts the private sector, and 
how this impacts a company, right? And we are we we hear a lot of saying that if you have no interoperable loss dealing with content takedown and all those other requests, you can generate a higher risk for companies to even invest in a certain country, right? So but I think we need to look to this problem also from a advocacy uh, perspective in terms of civil society and how this impact our ability. Many of us here are from civil society or academia slash civil society uh, 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 to actually act and contribute our point of view as stakeholders in this debate, right? And in this regard, I, I want to mention two of the main pillar principles I would call from for this work, which is exactly tra uh, transparency and traceability, right? I think these are crucial. Thinking about the bigger strategy, I think we can think about those as static to how we implement all of that, and at the end of the day, generate legal security to all of, of this due process framework you are talking about. Uh, so as a uh, civil society, I think we have a lot to learn from some other communities that have been around for some time and actually that has amazing that have amazing skill that we should be learned from and also because it's time is something that's timely in terms of funding opportunities uh, for civil society. So we, we see the wonderful open data community that has been uh, uh, board on the last couple of years, I'm for example part of the board of uh, the Open Knowledge Foundation in Brazil, and the ability those guys have to get some data and mm -hmm. make wonder visualizations and actually crowdsource <laughs> on how you include that data, it's incredible. And if we are talking about how important company transparency reports are for us as advocates and even to think about how human rights uh, uh, type norm than laws are implemented, implemented nationally, uh, we could also think about how we should knock the doors of governments to say, share this data, let the public play with it, let make visualizations of it so they are user friendly, and let them interact back to feedback both in national process but also international process like the Net Mundial. Interruption. Today, Data transparency reporting is mostly collected and provided by the companies. Do you think it would be useful to have the data also provided by the governments or the law enforcement agencies when they make the request, uh, so that it's a little bit of cross-referencing? And should it, at least some of this data be available in open data format so that people could make analysis out of it? Yeah, so that's exactly what I'm proposing because, uh, and I think you guys have been also talking about it for some time, and mm -hmm. my second practical, practical yeah, proposition is the coordination with other communities that already have the skill to do so. Uh, the, the access to information community, which has been responsible for actually supporting uh, access, access, access to information in many countries, including Latin America, like Brazil have a very strong one and so on. Uh, uh, they know how to deal with that and they have the skills to also knock the door of the government and say that's the data you should share and how you should share. And now we have those tools with uh, FOIA style uh, 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 procedures, right? So I think it all fits into both uh, on transparency, traceability, yeah. and maybe we should think if it's the moment for us to join efforts as stakeholders with companies to build some type of coordination platform where all that data is put across. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, Europe is developing the, I think, JIPO, you say, which is like the Internet Observatory. Brazil has an Internet Observatory that Carlos is involved with and so on. So this initiative, these platforms are multiplying. So mm -hmm. I think it's a very timely matter if we are able to see this in a holistic way. <laughs> so I think that's a little bit the, the, the purpose. And uh, as you guys say, the uh, technical standards to make this data interoperable, to make those repositories interoperable, it's there already. We have international recognizing standards for that coming from, for example, the open access movement, right, and the open education resource movement. So the technology is already quite uh, Talking about the uh, uh, uh you guys still have some days to send your input. So uh, the deadline for principles contribution for content contribution is March 8th, yeah. this Friday? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, and would be interesting to actually 
receiving more contributions. Some of them are already publishing the site, so the Net Mundial for who don't know about it is a meeting that's going to happen in Brazil on the 23rd, 24th of April. April. And it came from a, a, a very fortunate meeting between Fadi, the president of ICANN, and Dilma, our president, uh, 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 to discuss issues as surveillance and to discuss a new, more positive agenda for the development of internet governance ecosystem. A lot of big words. <laughs> and uh, US has endorsed the meeting, finally, after a lot of struggle there. And uh, I think it's a really great chance for us to move forward. What are the process? principles which include the technical principles we are talking about in terms of transparency for internet governance which we have to forward. Uh, and and the, the bad scenario and the risk we face there is that if we don't find some common ground to work together and hopefully blue process would be it, one of the, these common grounds, uh, uh, we may end up on the, in my personal view, wrongly used word of vocalization of internet. Uh, so um, that's I think what we hope for um, at the Thank you. Actually, there is a, um, a whole series about meetings. If you follow this topic a little bit, you may have seen the document that was distributed, among other things, yesterday, done by Best Bits. Uh, that this, all the meetings that deal with internet governance, they are becoming really, really uh, abundant. Pranesh, I wanted to say something very quickly because I want to uh, open a uh, little door in the last 15 minutes of questions. Just, uh, just one quick point about uh, transparency mechanisms, right, and takedowns. So, uh, in response to uh, the government's really bad law, uh, we actually came up uh, at the Center for Internet and Society with a counter uh, and proposed that to the government and to others. Uh, saying if you actually want to go down the note, uh, the takedown path, uh, then this is how you can implement it within Indian law while it's still being constitutional and respectful of free speech. And one of the things we proposed there was uh, that not only this mechanism was uh, was applicable not just to government sent takedown requests but to all takedown requests. And so we said the government should actually operate something like chilling effects or or, okay? And every time a private uh, actor, uh, any kind of intermediary receives a takedown request, they should forward that to the government and it be displayed on a public website, okay? And, uh, and if, when they act upon the takedown request, they actually should provide reasons for it which should be displayed alongside the initial request. So, uh, and we sought to build that into the law itself. Thank you. There are many, uh, many things that we can continue to, to cover. Let me open the, uh, the floor for, for questions. It can be questions about the project itself, how you can engage, participate, and so on. We are basically conducting the ongoing discussion to develop the different building blocks in a more operational manner among the, the different stakeholders that participate in the process. And again, there's more than 60 entities that are, that are involved in one or the other. We're also participating in physical meetings organized by third parties like this one, the Freedom Online Coalition, the IGFs, and so on. So your questions can be about how can you follow this thing, how can you uh, participate or input. But it can be also about everything that has been said. What are the things that, that trigger questions or clarifications or things that you believe are important to take into account in the in the discussion. Uh, so let me open the floor. Who, who has a, a question or a, a comment or a contribution? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to follow up with you about. Uh, uh, Center for Internet and Society, uh, and, uh, and if you can say where you are, I might have one with Internet and Society, the Yes. So uh, about amendments to the uh, IT Act, uh, as as I think you know, there's uh, you know there were some pretty systematic criticisms of the IT Act as it was revised in 2008, and to some extent, I wonder if uh, the you know the efforts to uh, to include, you know, posting uh, takedown requests are really just nibbling away at what is, you know, fundamentally flawed uh, 
a piece of legislation now, I and mean, what, what your larger plans are for addressing uh, you know, criminal offenses that exist under the current version of the IPI. Any other uh, question at that stage? Sure. So uh, just one quick note about uh, the IT Act before I, I respond uh, is that under Section 1, Subsection 2 of the Information Technology Act 2000, it's not just applicable within India, but, it's but it's, it actually says it's applicable outside India as well and uh, clarifies in Section 75 how exactly that is. But uh, it's interesting because I haven't really come across many laws, uh, at least any Indian law uh, previously, which talks about extraterritorial applicability of, of the law. Uh, that note apart, the Information Technology Act uh, has tons of horrendous provisions in it, uh, especially lots that were, that were brought in in 2008. And in fact, uh, one of the problems we had with the IT rules that were passed in 2011 under the IT Act uh, is that uh, not only are they unconstitutional generally, but they aren't even, they don't even fall within the IT Act. The rules, for instance, uh, the intermediary guidelines rules, were about takedown, okay? They were not about uh, the, but the parent provision is about in what cases the intermediary can be held liable for what someone else posts and in what cases they can't. Generally, the general principle is a good one, uh, which is if you have editorial control, you can be held liable. If you don't have editorial control, if you're, say, an ISP, etc., you can't be held liable. That principle was, was adopted, but it gets inverted in the rules. Okay, so uh, we've... Uh, at CIS, we don't really engage in many uh, many uh, court challenges, etc. Uh, we there there are complex reasons for for why uh, that is, including the fact that we get funding from outside of India. But uh, the best way forward, quite honestly, is court challenges, and uh, because there's a clear case to be made that some of these provisions are unconstitutional, and uh, there are uh, a few challenges right now before the Supreme Court. Uh, including some of the most notorious provisions uh, which we highlighted in 2008 itself uh, when these were, were adopted. Uh, I, I did a long blog post uh, on it at that point in time uh, and which eventually, which had some predictions which eventually unfortunately came to be true and, and caused many, uh, and, and two girls for instance were, were uh, jailed, uh, uh, two teenagers for criticizing what was happening uh, after the death of a politician about the, uh, the riot-like atmosphere almost that was taking place then. And, and for those kinds of things, people have been jailed. Uh, and, and so it's a, and, and of course they were released immediately. There was a huge outcry in India uh, about things like this, but the law needs to change and the government has been obstinate in saying it actually doesn't. It just needs to be applied properly. Uh, and and there's, uh, I think, a fundamental thing to, to take out of that, which is uh, this tension, and it's not just in the Indian law, it's here in the US with the CFAA, it's, it's in pretty much every law that deals with the internet, uh, that there is both a gap between what people intended and the language they used to, to put that down, and, and them defending their intentions. And quite honestly, I do believe the intentions of the Indian government were good, and I hit this depart from most of my fellow activists. Uh, in 2011, when they brought about the rules, when they copied Yahoo's terms of service, etc., I don't think they were ill-intentioned. That most activists think that they were trying to curb down on free speech, especially against criticism of the government of the ruling party. I actually don't think that was what they were trying to do. At least in this case, they have done that el elsewhere. Otherwise, but. Not in this case. They were lawyers just are stupid. Not lawyers are not creative sometimes. Yeah. Have to copy so, <laughs> yeah, and this is just, I, I think this is a brilliant case for the applicability of Hanlon's razor, uh, which is basically that don't attribute to malice that which can be attributed to stupidity. And I think the Indian <laughs> government was stupid, not that it was ill intention that it was trying to perk down on free speech. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be correct. <laughs> <laughs>
Any yes, a question in, in, in the back? And then the I'm uh, Pascal Hagman from Amsterdam with the Choke Point Project. Um, just a tangential remark uh, with regards to what Catherine said, with regards to in, um, technical standards are there. I'm, I'm not sure if that's, that's quite true, um, in the sense that a lot of the infrastructure of the, of the internet, we need to make a distinction between necessary information and, and the necessity uh, for, for, for operational uh, operation of the internet um, and optional publication, which is the transparency reports and, and that kind of stuff. Um, it used to be the case that the, the, the technical infrastructure of the internet requires a certain openness to, to even function. And that has led to a lot of innovation, that has spurred a lot of freedom. Now, of course, it's the case with many private actors, uh, Facebook, Google, you name them, they publish some data, but it's, it's on a uh, need-to-know basis. It's not really what, well, maybe, but, and we need legislation, we, we, need, we need regulation uh, to, to enable the same kind of forcing effect that technology used to provide. It used to be the case that technology forced, if you, if you want to publish a website, it needs to be on the internet, the IP address needs to be public, uh, the routing needs to be public, all this stuff is necessary for the website to even function, and that gives you a lot of opportunity for innovation, freedom. Well, but once you post a message on Facebook, it becomes, it's just in their system, and there's no real way except you, you can send them an email and ask. Um, and and this, this, this is an aspect I think Prabesh touched on very well. When there's a takedown request, it needs to be published. It, need, it needs to get out there, because otherwise we will never have the same kind of forcing effect that led to well, I think many great developments, and yeah, that, that's just a general comment I would like to make. Thank you. Yeah. And then we'll, I think we'll wrap up for the yeah, five more minutes. Yeah. I just want to be talking about different things. Uh, so when I was talking about standards and internationally recognized standards, I'm not talking about the structural and the logical layer of the internet. I'm actually talking Human about rights. what? Human rights. No, no, no. In the technical part, I'm talking about data sharing standards and repository setting standards. So for example, the Ministry of Science and Technology in Brazil have a toolkit on how public universities set repositories to public their production and their knowledge, right? Open access here in the US, as you know, NIH has a database, right? There is another repository here, I'm just blanking now, that has more than 200 databases on genetic information. So, that's the type of standards I'm saying. It exists already, and that is the type of community I know exists already, both in the US, in Brazil, very strong in Brazil, and Europe, very strong in Brazil. OKF has tons of chapters in Europe. So it's the, this, this other layer that's available to enable that, as you said, le, uh, legal and policy change to actually uh, mandate uh, transparency from government. So we already have the technical layer and we need to unite forces to ensure that countries uh, make a commitment as part of their open knowledge, open government partnership commitments that they also gonna publish data regarding to things that impact in human rights, for example, and not just spending, which is important, but it needs to be to go beyond that, right? Or holes in your street or things. Thank you. So we're going to wrap up. I will ask you to um, maybe each try to think of one or two things that struck you in the discussion or that you think should be something we should take strongly into account in the in the discussion of the project in the coming in the coming months, just one point I want to I want to make in that regard. There's one distinction that I didn't make that came to mind after this question in the early presentation. When we talk about internet governance, there's a slight distinction between what we could call governance of the internet or governance on the internet. 
a governance of the network with the standards, the protocols, the IP addresses, the uh, naming system, ICANN, and all the stuff is one thing. But the big challenge that we have today is that there is very little framework to address governance on the internet, like what people do with this, with this network. And we are clearly, and I wanted to clarify this in the end, in that, in that layer. So let's move in that direction, or maybe in the reverse order as it was started this way. <laughs> So one or two things that you take from the discussion and uh, or that struck you, or that you would like to input it or see addressed in the uh, in the project in the coming year. <laughs> so I think they, they are modes of my day by day work. It's a little cheesy, I'm sorry, but. Transparency and cooperation, I think it's really important, and being in the same room with different actors, uh, being able to do that, but also being humble enough to reach out to other communities and learn from them, I think it's important, so transparency and cooperation. Um, so I think my, 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 my suggestion is actually a very practical one. Um, if you look at the different discussions that are going on now, it's, it seems often that people just don't know where to look for answers, right? It's because there's so many fora in which Kind of, like these kinds of issues are, are discussed and not always in a very intelligent manner, so sometimes people are just like put up a little bit. Um, so I think it would be very relevant for you to point out exactly yeah. like what kind of use your discussion will be for other discussions. So to make that very clear, not to be too conceptual or just because people people need to know what the relevance, how it feeds in into particular discussions. Okay. Um, I, and this is not just based on the conversation today, but a few that I've been having yesterday as well, uh, that the idea of data havens uh, are, are something that are uh, that really need to be taken account of uh, while you're, you're thinking of, of the larger jurisdiction related issues. Because uh, the desires of, of activists to, uh, uh, you know, have the application of their local laws when their local laws are good uh, with respect to privacy is uh, at odds with the idea of, of protecting data havens where like for instance Iceland wants to be where privacy and, and free speech are protected etc and, uh, and and this tension is something that uh, that is very difficult to resolve and is, is something that I think uh, would be good to consider. Um, I think I think a lot about um, where the hard boundaries are and where the grey areas are. So we deal with the layer of there's the international legal framework and then the, um, the domestic legal framework and then the policy that sort of lie underneath that. And particularly, I think it's in a lot of our different fields, whilst there are some hard boundaries, there's a lot of um, cases where the law isn't clear, where there's a lot of scope for interpretation, and that comes down to how are governments interpreting this international legal framework, or how are they interpreting their own domestic legislation, or um, how are companies interpreting um, where they have discretion as to whether or not to hand over that information. So I'm always interested in, um, there are boundaries, but there are a lot of grey areas in that, and I think that's where informed discussion and um, appropriate pressure or discussion also from civil society and academia is, is really valuable, not just seeing the hard boundaries and long-term projects, but what you can do in the grey areas. I've got two very big comments. Like, first one, personally, I'm pretty much interested in to the unintended consequences of the adoption of this or that uh, procedure when it comes to internet governance and regulation. So I was speaking a little bit about uh, data localization. And definitely when we talk about data localization, there's a, a bunch of issues that we could address, but one that sometimes is not well addressed is the impact if a country like Brazil end up adopting a data localization uh, provision, such as the one that we have right now, what will be the impact on other countries in Latin America, and especially for bloggers and activists that sometimes face a hard time in, with their governments. To have one country as Brazil saying it's a good idea to have all the data of the, nation, of the nationals 
stored here is something that could be really useful for the judiciary power of Brazil to have access to that data, but at the same time, people in other countries in Latin America would feel like that's the perfect excuse for you to store nationally the data of all bloggers and activists in that country, and that's an unintended consequence of a discussion that was brought into the Morpheus view because of these golden revelations and the national government of Brazil decided to push for that. So that's a personal interest on, on the Internet and Jurisdiction Project. And a more practical suggestion is uh, on the website of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, we have monthly the, the selection of uh, news, reports, and articles, and I think it's a great starting point for people who want to be aware of what's hot in that specific, uh, it's so hot right now, uh, on this specific month, that could be a good starting point to understand this whole picture as we are discussing so many subjects. Thank you. Thank you for the advertisement. The site is internetjurisdiction.net. And one thing that we briefly touched upon that both Carolina and, and Carlos were addressing is we're in an environment where if not enough discussion is conducted among the different stakeholders, such as this one, which is not the only topic, but as a procedure and a type of interaction, if this is not the case, the proliferation of individual decisions, either by government or by platforms, may lead to what could be called fragmentation, partitioning, re-territorialization, whatever, which I think is what none in this room uh, believe is the right way to go. So, thank you very much for your attendance. I hope it was interesting. And um, let's talk more, contribute, come to the site. Thank you very much for having come here.